Good day. I'm Mike Bartlett, past chair of the CSCE National History Committee, here to tell you the story of the Conestoga River Bridge. It was erected as a full-scale test specimen in 1975 and has been carrying highway traffic ever since. I'd like to start by warmly acknowledging co-author Peter King of Western's Boundary Lair Wind Tunnel Laboratory. Essentially, I'll be presenting five pieces today. We'll start with an introduction and a little background on the need for the bridge. Then we'll review the design and construction of the bridge and the research conducted. And finally, we'll reflect on the historical significance of the bridge. The Conestoga River Bridge carries Regional Road 85 over the Conestoga River, just east of St. Jacobs, Ontario, which is just northwest of Kitchener-Waterloo. It has a composite superstructure with four slender, variable depth steel girders supporting a cast-in-place, post-tensioned concrete deck. Notice how slender the bridge is. The bridge represents the culmination of extensive research activity by the Engineering Research and Development Branch of the Ontario Ministry of Transportation and Communications. The group, according to Roger Dorton, was small but had a surprisingly large number of significant projects underway. Its activities included checking the load carrying capacities of bridges thought to be deficient using full scale load testing, carrying out truck weight surveys to develop more accurate truckload models for bridge design and evaluation, and investigating the application of compression membrane theory to design reinforced concrete deck slabs that require a fraction of the reinforcement needed for the conventional designs of the day. They recognized that they needed a full te scale test specimen to confirm their findings. Also to confirm the dynamic effects of the traffic loads, as Akalish has noted, are sensitive to the first flexural frequency of the bridge and to verify that steel bolts could be used to replace shear studs to achieve fully composite behavior of steel concrete superstructures. So here we see the A325 150 millimeter long bolts with nuts above and below the flange acting as shear studs. Roger Dorton's autobiography celebrates the support received from the Ministry of Transportation's senior bureaucrats. The senior management became very interested in the Conestoga River Bridge project, and rightly so, as they would be held responsible for the opening for public use, a bridge with many innovations that was not designed to the accepted code. Without the high level support, this unusual project would never have been realized. They showed a forward-looking acceptance of risk and change, characteristics not always associated by the public with civil servants. The Conestoga River Bridge was selected because it was already listed to be tendered and its rural location limited pedestrian use and so alleviated deflection concerns. They could go with a very slender structure, not worry about deflection, and have the first flexural frequency fall outside the two to five hertz range, typical of truck suspension frequencies that Akalish had talked about previously. Here's the cross section and elevation view of the bridge. The objectives of the redesign included using a new live load model, the proposed Ontario bridge design load proposed by Chagley and Dorton in 1973, determining the fractions of truck load moments carried by each girder by a computerized grillage analysis that yielded much smaller girder demands compared to those obtained using the Ashto 1973 specifications. Using distinct dead load factors of 1.1 for the structural steel and concrete deck, 1.15 for the barrier walls, and 1.33 for the asphalt wearing surface, and a low live load factor of 1.1 because the specified proposed Ontario bridge design load represented an upper bound vehicle weight. Eliminating any deflection limitation to allow a very shallow and flexible superstructure, 
It was intended that the first lecture of frequency lie outside the range of two to five hertz that is typical of heavy truck frequencies. This would prevent resonance between the truck and the bridge and so markedly reduce the dynamic effect of the live load. As we've said, use ASTM A325 volts as shear connectors instead of conventional welded shear studs. Using conventional deck slabs designed to resist transverse bending by the usual Ashto 1973 working stress method for the south half of the bridge, but creating 12 test panels at the north half with thicknesses of 180, 190, and 203 millimeters, and transfiller steel requirements of 0.95%, the cash toe requirement of the day, 0.6%, 0.3, and 0.2%. So the minimum steel percentage was almost a fifth of what Ashto required. Finally, post-tensioning the deck longitudinally to satisfy allowable tensile stress limits at ultimate limit states and ensure composite behavior in the negative moment regions. In the winter of 1974-75, the steel girders were erected, as shown here. And this photograph of the deck before concrete placement shows the longitudinal post-tensioning tendons, the bolt shear connectors, and the different quantities of transverse reinforcement. Note, for example, the spacing in the foreground here is twice as large as that in the middle ground here. Full-scale load tests were conducted in 1975. Scaffolding beneath the structure, designed by Peter King, provided access to the instrumentation. This figure shows the static deflections and bending moments due to two trucks placed symmetrically to achieve the maximum moment in a side span. The values are shown for each of the fuller girders of the cross section. The solid lines are the values predicted analytically using the grillage analysis, and the open circles are the observed values. The agreement between the observed and predicted values is excellent, validating the grillage analysis and so the reduced live load distribution factors assumed for design. These are oscillograph traces of four dynamic tests where a single vehicle crossed the bridge in the west lane. The free vibration measured in trace one indicates that the first flexural frequency is 1.6 hertz. As this is less than the range of typical truck frequencies, there is no resonance and the dynamic effects are low, as predicted. For the other three traces, the frequencies correspond to the third mode of vibration. For the bump test, trace four at the bottom, where a two by four was placed at the middle of the main span and the truck was driven across it, the forced frequency of 3.5 hertz lasts less than two seconds, but during this period, the highest observed dynamic amplitude, 0.25, occurs. They actually parked a vehicle and MTO engineers sat in that vehicle next to this bump. And with the suspension in the vehicle, the engineers were unaware of the dynamic effect of the truck going over the bump. This figure shows the stress distributions in the girders inferred from the strain gauge readings. In all cases, the observed location of the neutral axis corresponds closely to that corresponding toward the fully composite section and well above that computed for the non-composite section. The bolt shear connectors are clearly effective. The test deck sections performed very well, even though, as noted previously, the transverse reinforcement was as low as one-fifth of that required by the Ashto 1973 provisions. The Conestoga River Bridge is historically significant because it is novel. It's the only bridge that we're aware of that was designed using unpublished design standards to be used as a test specimen before being put into regular service. It's also significant because of its creators. The MTO Engineering Structures Research Branch, although small, was carrying out substantial and world-leading research that had a tremendous and lasting impact on bridge design in Canada. Roger Darton and Paul Chagley, in a 1977 publication to support a 1977 CSCE National Lecture Tour about the development of the Ontario Highway Bridge Design Code, note, quote, the testing of this bridge in 1975 and an evaluation of the test results has given the required backing to the concepts mentioned so that they have been advocated for inclusion in the code. The Conestoga River Bridge will be a future CSCE National Historic Site. We're now working with the region of Waterloo who owns the structure 
to obtain their formal support. The wording for the plaque is as shown. Roger A. Dorton, Paul F. Chagley, and others working for the Ontario Ministry of Transportation and Communications Engineering Research Group designed the Conestoga River Bridge in 1974. Their design used innovative criteria developed from recent research. These criteria, validated by instrumenting and testing of the full-scale structure in 1975, address the dynamic response of highway bridges, the behavior of concrete deck slabs, and the lateral distribution of truckloads to the main girders. These tests provided the required confirmation so that new methods could be included in the first edition in 1979 of the Ontario Highway Bridge Design Code, the forerunner of modern Canadian bridge design standards. At one of our planning meetings, Peter Bach described the Conestoga River Bridge as the first bridge design using the Ontario Highway Bridge Design Code. This isn't entirely true. The traffic load model was different, as we've seen, but still, in a, it's a nice way to think about it. I'd like to thank again Peter King, whose MESC thesis at Western presents a comprehensive analysis of the Conestoga River Bridge test results, and to Doreen for putting up with me. My email's there. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks.